بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله الذي العظيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا ونبينا أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين لا سيما بقية الله في الأرضين أجل الله تعالى فرجه الشريف اللهم أخرجني من ظلمات الفهم وأكرمني بنور الفهم اللهم افتح علينا أبواب رحمتك وانشر علينا خزان علومك برحمتك يا أرحم الراحم الحمد لله we have finished uh, unit 5 which was about family now we start unit 6 this is about society we want to see how Islam brings order, welfare, and justice to society. Because there are many things we can discuss, but our focus is on three things, order, justice, and welfare. Uh, today, we talk about uh, legislation, about law, because we want to see how we can establish order. One of the characteristics of human beings is that they are social by nature. Uh, they say, Al insanum madaniyun bitaba. By nature, we are social. Uh, there are discussions here among the scholars what we mean by nature when we say by nature what do we mean uh, some people say it means that it's part of our fitra it's part of our very uh, creation that we live together like for example bees and ants some people say we based on our practical reasoning decide to live together and maybe some people can say both that we have innate tendency for social life and our intellect also confirms that because human beings on the one hand have lots of needs that they cannot meet individually yeah I have so many needs that I cannot meet myself alone. On the other hand, in addition to needs, we can have so much of uh, higher degrees of quality of life that again to reach that we need to live together. So it's not just a matter of survival that if we want to survive we have to live together. If we want to have more comfortable life, more meaningful life, more spiritual life, we need also to live together. If we want to develop, you know, civilization, we need to live together. Because animals don't have that much potential. If you look at the way of life among animals, you see they have not changed. They have not improved. The way they made their for example, shelter or nests or, you know, homes, 1,000 years ago are now the same. But human beings are always changing and trying to improve. Sometimes, of course, instead of improve, they destroy, but <laughs> they think they are improving. So, in order to survive and in order to have better qualities of life, our Fetra and our reason tell us we should live together. But living together is not always easy. Why? Because maybe few people, few individuals can live together without need for a code of law for a legal system. They can simply agree on things, especially if it's a family. But when we have tens, hundreds, thousands of people living together, 
and uh, conflicts of interest comes, shortage comes, competition comes, and some people also are greedy, some people are arrogant, some people are not patient. So then we need to have a way to tell everyone that this is your right and you should not demand more. And this is your responsibility. So certainly at certain point in history, human beings needed codes of law. Before that maybe it was simple, but Allah Metabatabai Rahmatullah Alai says that the first prophet who was given Sharia by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was Prophet Nuh. Shara'a lakum min ad-deen ma wassa bihi Nuhan. Maybe before Prophet Nuh there were some instructions but not a Sharia as a system because life was more simple. Or in the verse which Allah says, Kana nasu ummatan wahida first people were one united nation <laughs> yeah but then they disagreed they had differences then they had conflicts then they had you know fights and Allah sent the prophets to teach them how to unite but then they differed about the teachings of the prophets afterwards. So the prophet was bringing unity, but then after that prophet, the followers were fighting about what that prophet said, and then they were dividing again. So, there was a time that life was very simple because human society was very... Uh, uh, a small and at early stage of development but after some time there was a need for law and this system of law or sharia was introduced by messengers not that every prophet had sharia many prophets taught people sharia of another messenger or a messenger of god because uh, Rasul was only 313. Prophets were 124,000. So all those 124,000 prophets, they were not Rasul. Only 313 of them were Rasul. Many times prophets preached what Allah had given as a message to a messenger. Maybe their time or before them. Sometimes they lived together. Sometimes was before And the final Sharia of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the Sharia of uh, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Although the philosophy behind all these divine laws, the philosophy is the same, principles are the same, framework is the same. There is no room for zulm in any of them, no room for mischief, no room for, I don't know, uh, cheating, dishonesty, uh, stealing, theft, uh, murder, uh, adultery. These are all common. But details are different and, you know, how expanded it is. Some people, they have another view about the source and origin of law. This is discussion in philosophy of law. Some people say instead of receiving our laws from religion or from God, we can draw our laws from nature. Actually, even some religious people, uh, many uh, religious people also have said this, not to deny uh, religion, they are very religious, but they say God has created this nature also in the way that nature is like the book of creation and we have the book of a scripture. Uh, maybe you have heard natural law theory. Natural law theory is a very famous theory and 
very popular among our uh, Christian brothers and sisters and they believe that we can draw uh, principles of law from nature so they say the same way that nature works can inspire us about how we should live it has lots of positive points and we also believe that uh, laws of God in creation and revelation match but it has also some issues and some ambiguities I have a paper uh, about uh, foundations of uh, ethics where I have talked about natural law theory uh, inshallah I will try to share with you the link uh, so for example over there I have said one of the problems with natural law theory is we cannot easily understand what is natural for example for men is it natural to keep long hair or not you can say it's natural <laughs> Because if we just leave it, our hair will grow. But you can also say it's natural for men to, for example, trim their hair. So what is natural? Or, for example, for human beings to fly, is it natural or not natural? Maybe someone says it's against law of nature that we are trying to fly. We shouldn't have tried to fly. So to say what is natural or not natural is not always easy. Especially to say what is natural is more... To, we can say what is against nature, but to say what nature tells us... Because sometimes also in nature you have different patterns. Yeah? Uh, about you know for example marriage etc so there are many things that when we have our understanding we can benefit from nature but if we want to learn everything from nature it can be ambiguous uh, in any case this is one theory some people say no neither we take it from revelation nor from nature we make the law based on social contracts we agree uh, on what is uh, normal what is not normal what is acceptable what is not acceptable and we can change over time our ideas or people in every society can have their own opinions uh, this is also a theory which has lots of problems <laughs> because on what basis these people are going to agree if human beings have no way to define what is ethical and what is not ethical what is right or what is not right then how they are going to agree those who have more power they will f impose their ideas either by force or sometimes by manipulating public view through propaganda etc they impose their ideas on people we need to have something transcendent something beyond human beings that tell us what is right what is not right so that we surrender ourselves to that but if we want to create what is ethical what is not ethical so then what is wrong in doing those things which we think are unethical if we are making a slavery good or bad then someone says okay i am in favor of a slavery because you are making it bad it's not bad in itself we say a slavery in itself has a moral position and we have to discover through agl through revelation through nature whatever method which is acceptable we have to discover anyway these are some points in philosophy of law and here just uh, in order to say that what is our understanding our understanding is that the most reliable source
for understanding laws is religion after we make sure that this religion is really authentic not any religion but a religion which is authentic which we are sure that is from God that's the best way to get our law then you may say how you understand religion here we have a jtahat so through a scholarship the best available scholarship we try to understand the scripture what can be better than this you have a scripture and you refer to the best available scholarship along with taqwa and piety we should also always remember that religious law is not in order to serve any authority or even to serve God in the sense that we can benefit God Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he is in the position of making law or legislation he acts like a wise advisor he is guiding us towards our own interest therefore we say in usul al-fiqh that religious commands are indeed instructions to what aql also demands when a doctor tells you take this medicine you shouldn't think that by taking this medicine you are serving the doctor <laughs> if that doctor is a good doctor and has really understood what is diagnosed you know your problem and has understood what is you know this medicine for properly so it's a wise experienced knowledgeable selfless doctor he would just tell you what is good for you and in the case of Allah is even greater because Allah doesn't have any need even he doesn't need you know uh, for example to live by you know visiting do, you know, patients etc everything is just for our interest and if we had the same knowledge or at least part of the knowledge of Allah we would have come to the same conclusion about every religious law and one of the also beauties of this system is that this system is not only for fixing problems when things go wrong many legal systems just they are there to stop offense so when someone offends they bring him to the court they have I don't know financial or other kinds of penalty etc but our system starts with internal taqwa if Islam is followed 90% or more or less of problems would be prevented only exceptional need would remain for going to the court maybe then for example people have genuine disagreements sometimes you know it's possible that two muttaqi sometimes they don't remember you know what they agreed or they have you know but if we are muttaqi we shouldn't have so many prisons and so many courts and so much police uh, if we follow Islam unfortunately the problem is that uh, the main part of Islam which is spirituality and akhlaq uh, we sometimes neglect and then when things go wrong and we have difficulties and we have fights etc then we want to fix the problem by law 
Then there is a mention of some aspects of Islamic judiciary system about the way Islam tries to uh, establish justice, the idea of you know compensation, some kind of penalty, some kind of you know uh, punishments or the right for uh, retaliation and at the same time recommendation for forgiveness about how to offer testimony and whose testimony would be accepted about judge and what qualities judge a judge must have so there are few also points about this to just give you a glimpse of Islamic legal system along with its judiciary system but this is a huge you know area of a study and uh, in our fiqh, if you remember when we had you know introduction to fiqh, we said several books of fiqh are about hudud, qisas, diyat, and uh, also we have you know qadha. Uh, I think this much is enough, and uh, we covered what is in the book, uh, the main points. Inshallah, bi'iznillah. In the next session, we will have a discussion about leadership, how we need to form governance if it's Islamic society. If there is no Islamic society, we have to understand our position to the governing system. But if there is Islamic society where you know, people are uh, all Muslims, uh, we would see what is Islamic model of leadership. And then, inshallah, we will have a discussion after that about welfare. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen.